The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. I really wanted to let that go for a bit, but we have to begin. Uh, welcome to the Stoa, everyone. Peter Limber, steward of the Stoa, the place where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of this very moment. Uh, and today we have my fellow meta tribalist, Tyler Alterman, um, here with us today. And I think it was like uh, a year ago, you just you, like you, you emailed me and you're like, hey, I'm coming to Toronto, let's meet. I'm like, who's this guy? <laughs> I'm, like, <laughs> I'm like, okay, let's meet. And then the, we had a drink and it was awesome, uh, really great conversation. And then he texted me afterwards, Peter, you should be the mayor of Toronto. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> bromance begins um so uh tyler oh yeah you're, you're mute tyler i'll let you unmute yourself if you want to rift already uh, i was just gonna say I, I meant it i meant you should be the mayor I, I i well i think i was specifically saying you should be the mayor of the toronto like scene and now oh. i think you should be the mayor of the the entire scene <laughs> my, my ego just uh, elevated that compliment um, All right, that's my goal <laughs> Um, so yeah, uh, and, and Tyler did this awesome tweet thread called uh, the Dawn of the Meta Tribe or something like that, where he discusses this concept of the Meta Tribe and how we're sort of in this age where this thing could exist. Um, so we're going to uh, jam, uh, rift on it a little bit, jam on it. And uh, if you have any questions, start throwing in the chats. I'll call on you and meet yourself. And I imagine we'll have an organic discussion. Uh, this will be on YouTube. So if you don't want to be on YouTube, just indicate that in chats. So any, any opening thoughts? Um, at the risk of monologuing, any opening thoughts on uh, uh, what the Metatribe is? Yeah, I told Peter to stop me if I started monologuing because I have a, sometimes I have a bad habit um, with that, um, which a few people here probably already know. The, the first few minutes I, I was trying to, I was shouting out a few people in the audience, but I think I was muted the whole time. So he hello friends. Um, okay, so uh, TLDR, I think the, I would describe the Metatribe as being something like more, more like a sociological phenomenon than an actual social movement. So I, I, I would describe it as being something distinct in uh, type than something like game B or metamodernism or effective altruism or the, or the rationality movement. Um, because with each of these different things, they, they, um, they tended to have some amount of, some greater amount of central organization. I mean, to a certain degree, the type already existed uh, and the organizers coalesced those people. So, you know, in the case of rationality movement, you had Eliezer writing, not a lot of people know this actually about the, the rationality movement. One of the biggest things getting people into the rationality movement was Eliezer writing Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality, which was a Harry Potter fan fiction. And then that in turn was one of the biggest things responsible for the creation of the effective altruism movement um, because the rationality movement fed into that. Um, but then the the effective altruism movement itself also I, th I think you had Will Will McCaskill earlier on earlier today um, had a had a set of extremely competent organizers right at the beginning I think Will was there at the beginning um, you had Toby Ord there at the beginning um, you had Jeff Anders there at the beginning and they they all sort of like coalesced and formed a conference um, to deliberately coin the term and cohere the thing as a movement. Um, this is a lot of talking for not describing what the meta tribe is. Basically, I think that the meta tribe isn't like that in that it's kind of more a set of people who find themselves at the end of fixed points of view, um, who find themselves at the end of not only modernism and, and postmodernism, but um, find themselves in, in a place where it doesn't really make as much sense to them to say, this is the one true ideology, this is the one true religion and so on. Um, however, they've been typically there are feeders from these from these previous phenomena. So, uh, rationality seems like it's a big feeder. Um, I would say effective altruism as well. Then you have events um, like Burning Man. I would say is another feeder and ephemeral, which is sort of like Burning Man at sea for Silicon Valley people. Um, and then and then there are things which are more almost like pure meta tribe, which I describe as feeders to the to the broader meta tribe. Which I, I would think Game B is this, the Stoa is this. Um, Daniel Schmachtenberger feeds a lot of people into it. And then, um, but the, the highest concentration, interestingly, I think is this sort of weird conversational shelling point or, or gathering place that you find in a specific 
algorithmically created section of Twitter, <laughs> like the, the way it's been created. But, you know, people talk about Twitter being hell and, and people constantly like uh, verbally assaulting one another. But there's this one section of sort of meta tribe Twitter that's evolved out of what you might call, and I can, I can define some of these terms, but out of post-rationalist Twitter and rationality Twitter, where everyone is just really nice and trying to earnestly like take pretty uh, non-partisan views on all sorts of different issues, discuss things um, with some semblance of rationality, but like not leaving out romanticism. Um, and uh, it's largely sort of the algorithm to thank in a, in a particular way, because it's all the people liking each other's uh, comments and then being suggested uh, a profile, which is, a, which is more of the same, essentially. So it's one of these things that's kind of emerged, I would say, most in Twitter as, as due to these algorithmic bubbles. But then you see it taking place all over physically in the world, too. So I would say that there are pretty physical Metatribe networks, too. But I want to emphasize that it's not like a formally, at least the way I see it, it's not a formally organized thing, but more an emergent phenomenon of a bunch of people who have all read similar books and engaged similar memes and, and so forth. I'd be, I, Peter, I'd be curious to have you, um, I'd be curious to have you define it because the, the way that I heard the term was from you. Um, it was a, between a conversation between you and Daniel Thorson, I think on, I forget whether it was your podcast or his. Um, and then and then it might've originally come from Jared James, but you guys, I felt like fleshed it out during that conversation. Right. I can't remember what Daniel and I were talking about, but the conversation that uh, is coming to mind is the one I had uh, uh, with Jason Snyder, that, who's in the room right now from the, oh, the both end. Uh, podcast and jason's like a, he's like the super connector of the meta tribe and i don't even think he likes the word meta but anymore but uh <laughs> and we were talking with jared uh jason colin morris and uh, tim adelin um and, and i mentioned or just i don't know who mentioned this but i got uh this dichotomy of like kinetic tribe you know like becoming tribal around your neighbors and you know resilience localism all that type of stuff and the meta tribe like kind of the people that resonate with your ideas uh, who are in that kind of meta-modern post-rational space because they're not really next door. I can't really just say, hey, don't ring their doorbell, but I can throw a beacon on the internet, like an event or a podcast right. and, attract and find the others that way. And then have, and then the idea with places like the Stoa or Interintellect, uh, all these other kind of campfires that are emerging is to get into, you know, relationship. Like, like let's feel each other. Let's talk to each other. Let's kind of like... Um, you know, belong together. And you can do that better on, on a Zoom call rather than just like a, you know, a tweet. Um, mm -hmm. So that's the idea is I get the sense of tribalness online with people who are into these meta uh, ideas and post-rational proclivities. Yeah. And, you know, the interesting thing about that word meta tribe is it's pretty funny for, for a couple of reasons. One is that if you were to try, where if, I think if you were to try to assign the label meta tribe to, to most meta tribe members, they wouldn't be interested in having a label applied to them, um, which is an interesting feature of a tribe just because typically when we talk about tribes, it's about kind of like, you know, wearing your baseball jersey and also your like Yankees number one mitt on your on your hand. And for the meta tribe, it feels almost like the opposite because it's those, it, it feels like it's a bunch of these kids who never knew what lunch table to sit at in middle school. Um, and who maybe, you know, the way I described it, which a bunch of people reacted to very viscerally, is sort of these in-betweeners who have a bunch of friends who are the skaters and a bunch of friends who are the punks and a bunch of friends who are the drama kids and maybe some friends who are the jocks. And then in today's, you know, more uh, post-middle school scene, like a bunch of friends who are social justice, a bunch of friends who are hyper-conservative or even neo-reaction a bunch of people who are gray tribe or rationalists and scientists, but then they don't really identify with any of these things. And they typically feel not ostracized, that's the wrong word because a lot of them are actually sort of widely accepted by these groups, but maybe um, in some significant sense alone because it never makes sense for them to just see the world through any one of these lenses. Um, it's sort of one of these things where, you know, there's this fable of um, the blind men trying to piece together the elephant um, and they, they, they take this seriously that um, each of these things is only feeling one part of the elephant. Um, so that's, that's the first reason I feel like Meta Tribe is funny. And then the second reason is that it's one of these tribes that in a funny way kind of disdains the idea of an outgroup. You know, it might, while, I've, while it's been my experience that the Meta Tribe folks are in favor of uh, things like curation, um, it seems like you know, curation of your allies, curation of, you know, who might join a meeting, et cetera, like not, not the sort of radical conclusion necessarily. Um, 
they seem to be pretty against the idea that there are like good guys and bad guys or people to be excluded because of their nature or, or what have you. And so on, on sort of, uh, on two fronts, the name kind of fails, um, but then it does really feel like there should be a, at least a placeholder label to, uh, to, to describe the thing. And I, and I don't think there's a really, I don't really think there's a better one. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering what you think are some common characteristics of people who would be, you know, fairly classified in this meta tribe. Um, and I recall Anna Gatt, uh, who, who does the intro intellect, she had like a great oh, yeah. article that had like all these things. I'm like, yep, that's me, that's me, that's me. Um, yeah. And with the, the meta tribe, what comes to mind, I was talking to Aaron Lewis about this too, when he came on my podcast. Um, it's like the gray pill, the idea of getting gray pilled. Uh, so like, <laughs> that's funny. This is the, the Venkatesh Rao term. So there's like, um, I like that. You know, you're, you, you don't take a blue pill. You're born into the blue pill in a way. You're born right. into nor normie reality. And then you right. take a red pill and the red pill could be like, a, yeah. you know, it could be anything. It could be social justice. It could be like some reactionary thing. And then it just really hardens you. It fossilizes your worldview, us versus them. And then you find your tribe through that idea. But then you take the gray pill and it kind of muddies the waters a little bit. And then you're uncertain of your previous red pill truth. I love that. Um, and then you're just kind of like, you know, so basically you bounced around and maybe you took a couple of red pills until you got to the, the gray pill. And I, and I right. think people who are in this had that experience. And then now they, they have this comfortable relationship or they have a good relationship with being in unknowingness. They don't have that existential anxiety that got over that, that phase. So I think that's right. one thing. Um, and the other thing is like this bespoke journey. Everyone has this eclectic bookshelf and things they right. read. First whatever. they read Nietzsche and then they read Dune and then they read <laughs> Thinking Fast and Slow. And then a right. different person, it's like, first they read Permaculture and then they saw Daniel Schmachtenberger videos. It's yeah. It's yeah. pretty winding. And then there's that that kind of like intellectual lone wolf autodidact quality right. there. And I think associated with that is the existential loneliness. Like they right. kind of really wanted to find the others. And so I feel like with the Stoa, there's all these like eclectic weirdos, uh, yeah. you know, like kind of like like finding each other. Yeah. And that, that's I think the, the I think part of the reason I wanted to articulate this as a social as a potential sociological phenomenon is just to reify it so there could be a little bit more of a beacon for the people to find each other despite um, most metatribers not wanting to adhere to any labels, it does feel pretty important to be having things like the stoa or um, a, a sort of dis a, a description of this phenomenon so that the people can can link up with one another. Because whenever, whenever I encounter someone who I would consider a sort of member of this demographic, they typically have this sort of jaw drop reaction of me and the other people having read many of the same books. Like, how is it that you have read Keith Johnstone's In Pro um, and also saw him on the, on the Stoa last week? And then also like you're interested in cognitive science and you've read a bunch of old school like sociological texts. And, and, and typically they found themselves to be the only person who cares about all these things. And, and meanwhile, they're also watching like, um, you know, uh, Charlie Kaufman films and, and they're quite an aesthete or like a romantic in that way and and typically they're you know they can only find uh, like meet, meet the needs to satisfy these different parts of them by hanging out with their particular artist friend and then maybe next night they'll discuss genetics with their scientist friend and then they typically don't have an outlet to to sort of synthesize them all but I think actually you know I don't think it's a special group in a way I think it's just what we're seeing is just the edge of an inevitable historical, it does it, it almost like maybe even the breaking of a historical cycle in a way, um, because it seems like up until something like the 1960s, uh, the, the the sentence, the, the the overall narrative, you could you could describe for for most people in the world is here's what's going on, <laughs> like that 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 as a sentence, where, whether it's here's what's going on, you're um, you, you attend your job from nine to five, you create an, an atomic family in the suburbs, that's one version. Another version is, here's what's going on. You're born into like a church family, you're, you're a Mormon for life. Um, no disrespect to the Mormons, I think they're pretty incredible faith. Um, and then I think after that, you see the, the, the 1960s and the sort of postmodern turn where it's more like, it's sort of the red pill as you described, it's going from the blue pill to the red pill of like, here's what's really going on. So you go from here's what's going on to here's what's really going on. And then people are, are tr trying to subversively describe uh, what appears to be the true underlying structures of, of reality or society um, in almost a, a sort of rebellious way. And then, like you said, typically pe people often have a bunch of red pills and then often they're in reaction to one another. 
So, you know, I've met people who, who took like the social justice red pill and then they took the near reaction red pill. And then only after that did they come to some sort of synthesis between these things, um, which you might describe as like the gray pill um, or sometimes even the reverse. I've I think I've encountered the reverse only once, <laughs> um, but nonetheless, it's happened. Um, and so it, it feels like the, the latest version is something like, I have no idea what's going on, <laughs> um, which, is, which is not to say, let's not figure out what's going on or like, let's not adopt provisional ideas of what might be happening and act on those. I think the Metatribe is unique in that it actually does take action. It's just not, it's not this postmodernist malaise where it's like, who knows, what is reality? Anyway, let me play Xbox or something like that. Um, typically they're pretty active people and they're trying to do things like solve existential risk, um, like um, the, the, the AGI problem or, uh, or synthetic biology pandemics. Um, or they're trying to solve something like the meaning crisis. So they're not inactive, um, but they are going about things from uh, sort of a multi-perspective view, which just feels like the inevitable thing to happen once you have a world, a globalized world full of tons of clashing narratives. Like it's impossible. I, I've got this from this line basically from uh, Soryu Foral, who's the head teacher at Monastic Academy, where the way he describes it is nobody believes the stories anymore. Like typically you would grow up inside of a story and adhere to it your entire life and not have it be challenged. And now you get a different story from your high school teacher. And then when you get home, you get a different story from your mom. And then when you go out and hang out with your friends, it's a totally different story about like what life is and what the world is from them. And so I think that inevitably is just going to lead to a breaking point because the mind seeks coherence. It doesn't, it doesn't sit well with um, cacophony and chaos. And I see the Metatribe is basically attempting to, to tame the chaos by trying to find some some synthesis path where you can have all these shifting truths and not be like whirling through uh, a maelstrom all the time. Uh, so I'm going to pivot to the chats in the moment or the Q and A. Uh, yeah. Another thing I want to present to you, um, I noticed like maybe a, a meta tribal skill set that I see is like the meta game, um, mm -hmm. and, and I currently hold that as like there's an ecology of games that are, we're currently playing, and the ability to zoom out and have choice of which one you want to play. And then you, you and I had a, had a good moment uh, when Keith Johnstone, uh, um, the guy who kind of invented improv, came to the yeah. store. Robin Hansen was there, and he asked him. <laughs> right? And then I privately messaged you like, beautiful. "Robin is cute, right?" And then, and then you said they're they're playing different games because Robin yeah. went through like you know system two analytical propositional mode, and Keith Johnson yeah. was like zero fucks given. <laughs> He's just like you know like just doing his own thing. Um, and so this idea of like not, not even code switching perspectives, but code switching different games, uh, right? Yeah, and do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I think, yeah, it's exhausting actually. Uh, someone, they, maybe they're here, I forget their Twitter handle, but someone commented on Twitter that um, being in this in this sociological space of like high betweenness centrality, um, of being between all these different scenes and not a part of any of them, um, and being forced to switch games all the time is 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 exhausting and also kind of heartbreaking actually which is why it feels nice to finally be attempting to come together. Because I, I don't know about you, but most, most of my friends, I would not give the, give the arbitrary label Metatribe. Um, you know, I have friends who are super conservative and Trump supporters. I have friends who are super social justice and marching in the streets every day. Um, I'm friends with tons of people who uh, the average post-rationalist might describe as a normie or something like that. Um, and I love them all like really deeply. But then I, I do have to kind of play a different game with each of them in order to relate. I have to, I have to do this sort of translational game. Um, and so it's, it's just this experience of like, I think a lot of people in this, in this place who are multi-hyphenate in this way, like scientist, artist, basketball player, or um, gamer, uh, biologist, or what have you, they, they're, con they're, they're finding that in order to get the thing that every human yearns for, connection, they have to become masters of the metagame, you might say. Um, or as you put it, actually, you had a good term for it, which is something like mimetic mediators, um, which I liked. As, as people who are, you know, if you, if you imagine all these memes swirling around in the atmosphere, like kind of like controlling giant swaths of the population, uh, what they have to be able to do is walk in between the different swaths to, to, to learn from them and gain their ideas and connect with them, um, while also not being consumed by them. And a lot of these things, a lot of these swaths, you know, people describe them sometimes on Twitter as egregores, which is an old term, meaning like um, thought forms, basically, it comes from the occult, uh, like Aleister Crowley and all them, uh, the idea of uh, something 
that is basically a meme with agency. Um, so something that's like an idea or a set of ideas, but that seems to actually behave kind of like a human, um, or at least something that isn't inanimate. Um, and then the thing about these things about egregores is they actually also try to capture you. So like, not only are you trying to, to jump over these um, fences in order to just commune with people um, in, in their in their in their game, but then also the games are often somewhat aggressive and trying to capture you as well, um, and often a bit zero sum. So that's at least a big part of my experience. What about you? Do you, do you find it? You seem to be more chill about it, actually. I, I'm trying to learn a sort of Zen attitude about it from what I from what I get from your vibe. Yeah, it's more of like maybe a stoic thing going on. But, oh yeah, yeah, um, and. Uh, one thing came up, uh, I might maybe tag in Jason for this one if, if he's willing, but uh, the memetic mediation thing you said, uh, this Jason and I were having a letter exchange and then this this term, uh, the psychodynamic is political, uh, mm -hmm. came up and how like, you know how the metamoderns, they call um, philosophical allergies, like you get triggered by certain kind of words or terms, but like yeah, you can right. use that as an opportunity for like shadow work. So the culture war is an oh, opportunity for, for shadow work. So as a memetic meteor, you go in, you, you adopt these reality tunnels, you get triggered, you do the work required, then that allows you yeah, to talk to them, vibe cool. with them and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I love that. J Jason, do you, do you want to add anything to that? If, if I'd love to hear more. If I can put you on the spot. <laughs> I can edit this part out of you if you want to be on. I'm not sure if I have much to add. I, I think you said it pretty well, Peter. Um, yeah, I, I mean, my, my emphasis was for a while was on how it's a contemplative practice, right? Because you have to, like you were saying, Tyler, you have to interact with all these worldviews, all these memes, and they trigger you in different ways. And in order to like keep your head above water, you know, you have to be able to process all of this stuff emotionally, right? And yeah. Mindfulness and, and all of that. And so um, uh, but at the same time, I, I, I don't, and this is more of a, a, a more recent, uh, a more recent, uh, place that I'm, I'm coming to is that I, I don't think it's good for anybody to be a memetic mediator all the time or to, to be in this space where they're just jumping around tribes and playing the games because you end up playing yourself. Right. Interesting. Sense. And, you know, like for me, it's like, there's like this balance of, you know, being this mimetic mediator role, this meta tribe type of thing, and then kind of settling down into um, d domesticity, I guess, <laughs> or, you know, like, I, like th there still might be some tribes that you resonate with more. And sometimes it's just good to like, you know, be there for a while and then come back. Yeah. Um, that, that's, that's all I would add. Yeah. And practically that's what I end up doing. Um, Although I don't know about you, but I, I, I find that I, if I, if I practice domesticity with any particular subtribe, I start getting antsy because, you know, I'll hang out for instance, like, like in the Bay area, I was, I was living in the Bay area for six years and most of my tribe were rationalists and effective altruists because back, back then I was one of the people uh, running the effective altruism movement. Um, I was, I was running the American office of the, the center for effective altruism at, at Oxford, which I think Will founded or was at least one of the original members of Will, Will McCaskill, who you mentioned. Um, but, uh, you know, that being my crowd, like I became, I, I got cabin fever for wanting to like go do contact improv or hang out with actual artists and not just people making like LED Burning Man art who happen to also be mostly programmers for most of the day. Um, and so how do you, I'm curious, J Jason, how do you manage that cabin fever part if you practice also the domesticity thing? Um, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, it helps that I'm kind of like, you know, we're all in kind of lockdown, you know what I mean? So I don't yeah. actually like get out much. <laughs> and so I can kind of like keep up with like what all of the different scenes are doing, you know, remotely, right. but good point. Um, no, I see what you're saying though. I mean, I, I think, I think for a while I was like on overdrive and I was just kind of like many different like private chat groups, you know, all over Twitter. And it, and it was just, I think I just burned myself out. And so I think I'm, I'm probably at the place now where give me like two months or a month and then I'll start itching to like, you know, to branch out again and uh, <laughs> I guess push myself in a different direction. Um, so I don't know, maybe, maybe you're just like, I don't know. <laughs> maybe how old are you maybe you're younger than me <laughs> maybe i'm just getting 30. old i don't know okay so yeah i'm 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 a few years older than you so maybe i'm just getting old <laughs> or maybe i'm more antsy yeah there we go there we go uh, uh, peter actually before we turn it to the audience I, I had two questions for you that i was that i'm still really curious about so there are these two phenomena that i'm linked to 
but that I don't really, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm a part of its demographic per se, even though I think that they're both parts of the meta tribe. So there's meta modernism, um, which I feel like in its attitude kind of describes almost exactly what I'm talking about as the implicit shared philosophy between meta tribe members, but it seems to be a kind of like sociologically distinct contingent, just in terms of like the people who hang out with one another inside of it. Um, that's one, and then and then there's game B, uh, which I I'm, I'm friends with a bunch of the game B people. Like I'm friends with Jordan uh, Jordan Greenhall, who um, I think was one of the original creators, um, if not the original creator. Um, and then I'm I'm curious as someone who I perceive to be more involved with these scenes. What is there? What, how do how would you describe their overlap with what you and I would describe as the what which feels like a sort of more um, a wider meta tribe, and uh, yeah, both in terms of ideology and maybe soci like sociologically, how do they relate? Like who's friends with who? Mm -hmm. um, do you have a take on that? Um, maybe I can riff off uh, your thoughts. My sense is, um, so I don't know enough about metamodernism. I, whenever I ask someone, what should I read on it? They point me to the same book, which I abashedly still haven't read, The, the Listening Society. Um, and that, that, that seems to be the core text. So I would have to really read that before I understood the, the ideological question, but at least on the sociological question, my sense is that um, that part of the Venn diagram has more overlap with memes like complexity theory. And this is just my sense, I don't know it very well. And things like permaculture, and um, I see the word regeneration thrown around a lot, which is which I take to be like a specific um, part of the overall like green green movement or green technology movement. Um, but they seem to be talking about like red pills and gray pills. They seem to have been red pilled away from that, and now further gray pilled away from that. Um, and then as for game B, it seems to have a lot of overlap, although not total overlap, with metamodernism. And from what I from what I understand, game B. Part, part of why I like it is my impression that it's actually quite general, is that it's um, it's describing game A, which is, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it, which I take to be a sort of seeking of an omni-win scenario where basically all sentient beings can come into um, some scenario where nobody feels like they have to defect on one another or lose. And just that attitude alone distinguishes it from, oh, sorry, that would be game B, um, not, not game A. So that game B is the omni-win scenario and then game A is the more default where you have these game theoretical dynamics where there's tons of defection going on um, and people aren't all sort of on the same side, so to speak, and, and performing sort of one global optimization game in order to make all, all sentient beings either on earth or beyond uh, have a good time. That's, that's my sense. And um, as for that, the, the overlap of that with the, the, um, the meta tribe, it seems like that's interestingly distinct from the post-rationalist contingent, at, at least at least in terms of who's friends with one another, and that maybe um, blends more with uh, metamodernism. But yeah. that that's just my outside view from not being a part of the the, the two scenes, metamodernism yeah. and uh, game B. Yeah, yeah, and, and I actually wrote a, um, an article or a journal entry called "Weird Stoicism," where I said like, you know, the ones I vibe with most, the tribes are game B, metamodernism, post-rationality, and integral theory. Um, and I and I think there's two different things you can look at. You can look at the, the tribal element, like what is the vibe of the tribe, like what are the type of people that get attracted to it, and then the propositions. And I would say the propositions yeah, are, are like really compatible and just like right. looking at different things, like meta modern is looking at right. kind of a developmental lens, you know, like there's pre-modernity, there's modernity, there's post-modernity, and there's meta modernity, where it consists of these meta systematic thinkers trying to make sense of like, you know, are that postmodern aftermath of all these fragmented realities. Uh, and when I did that white paper that had the multipolar war, I didn't know anything about right. metamodernism, but they all jumped on my radar and like, oh, we love this article, blah, blah, blah. And that's how I, I discovered them. Yeah, so it was like a metamodern article but not knowing what the term was. Okay, um, cool. And where game B is sort of like an instruction manual, I find like a really dry instruction manual of like how game A is problematic and then what game B could be without having an understanding of what it's gonna look like. Um, mm -hmm. So that's on a propositional level. And, but they both have the origins of, um, or they both were influenced by Ken Wilber, Integral Theory. So I know right. Daniel Schmachtenberger, he was influenced by Ken Wilber, um, Hansi Freinach, uh, Daniel Gertz, they were influenced by Ken Wilber. They have their criticism of them, obviously. And then the post-rat, 
they're probably in um, you know the same space, but they came from the rationalist you right. know, uh, kind of thing. But then they have a lot of overlap propositionally by being like in a meta modern post rational space. And I, and I well, think kind of like a stoa and these places are like where they're kind of intersecting for the first time. Right. That's the thing I was going to say to me, as far as I can tell, there are four, maybe five hubs, like formal hubs. So there's the stoa where you see, I, I think the overlap of all the demographic segments of the meta tribe, as far as I can tell, the post rack contingent, the EA contingent, the meta modernism game B, et cetera. Um, Silicon Valley people. Um, there's uh I haven't been to one yet, but the inter intellect salons, I think might be another one of these. Um, another one seems to be uh, monastic academy, where even just at monastic academy, like out of the monks that are there full time, like wearing their sashes and so on, there are there there are people who came in through less wrong, there are people and, and who want to um, like fight artificial intelligence risk, <laughs> like monks who want to fight artificial intelligence risk is, I, I just love that as a thing. Uh, and then there's, um, there's one more I'm forgetting, um, maybe it'll, oh, right. Um, the castle festival. I don't know if you've heard of that, but it's what my, uh, collaborator, Andre Ornish runs, um, on a yearly basis. It's, it didn't happen this year because of coronavirus, but it had Daniel Schmachtenberger at it. And then it also had like Ben Todd from 80,000 hours. I'm not sure if Will was there, but I, I know Ben at least was and a bunch of other EA folks. Um. And uh, oh, Reb, someone is saying in the chat, Rebel Wisdom. Yeah. That might be another one too. I've, I've really loved watching their videos. Oh, and uh, actually, there's a further one, which is, I would say, uh, Evolving Ground, which is being created right now by Jared Janes and Charlie Aubrey, um, which is interestingly like a bunch of uh, it's, it's Buddhism themed, Buddhist Vajrayana, which is a very different type of practice than traditional Buddhism, but it seems to also bring together, like, be a collecting basin for all the different demographics. I'm curious if you've heard of any others that are that are out there in the woodwork. Yeah, I'd say, you know, there's Rebel Wisdom, Future Thinkers. Um, right. Uh, Justin Murphy's Indie Thinkers is kind of a little different uh, kind of thread there, more reactionary. Uh, oh, interesting. Thing. I haven't heard of that. But he has a community. Uh, and I, I should have, like, did some uh, <laughs> disclaimer, like, this is super insider baseball <laughs> session that we're having at the, the store. Uh, I feel kind of bad. Um, but, yeah, let's, let's take in uh, some Q&A. So, Evan, you had a, a question. Yeah, so um, you described me to a T, as uh, many people in the chat were also saying here. Um, so thank oh, you. Cool. Uh, uh, that being said, so I've been struggling lately with something, which is that you know I've really pretty consciously and intentionally stayed away from having any sort of uh, public-facing online presence since pretty much literally the eternal September, say like early '90s. Wow, and um, <laughs> that is pretty early. I've been a fly on the wall for Less Wrong and Slate Star Codex and a bunch of the other communities you mentioned. And I've engaged with those communities a lot in person to varying degrees. Um, mm -hmm. And so that, that was nice. Um, but it seems like to sort of join in these sort of meta tribe conversations as a full participant these days that you have to have some sort of fairly curated online presence. Um, you know, you have to have a Twitter. It helps if you have a blog or a podcast so people know who the fuck you are, right? <laughs> and, uh, right? And otherwise, you know, there's a sense of like, how does one demonstrate one's qualifications to take part in the higher level discussions without those things? So I'm curious about your take on that. You know, th that level of what feels to me like sort of self-promotion gives me some like bad, creepy vibes. So, <laughs> you know, how, yeah. how, how can one connect and contribute to the discussion of the meta tribe without being on Twitter, without having a public facing blog, et cetera, et cetera. Well, first of all, epic background, holy crap. Um, but uh, second of all, I think, I think part, part of why I wanted to go into talking about these different collect collection points um, that, that Peter and I just talked about is I think a few of them, basically anybody can enter. So I think the, the STOA is one of these where you're certainly, well, the thing you're describing is real. Like you're more likely to have heard about the STOA if you have an online presence in the first place. Um, but also a, fr a friend can just send you a link to the STOA and you can pop into Zoom. Um, I would say the same is maybe, I haven't investigated inter-intellect. It might be similar in this way. Um, I would say evolving, evolving ground is also one of these more open things where you can join the evolving ground Slack. Um, I think their website is evolvingground.org, but I'm not sure. It yeah. probably, if you Google it, it'll pop up. I'm, I'm um, that, yeah. <laughs> oh, awesome. 
Um, but but to your point, I think you're you're pointing to a super real thing, and one <laughs> one route around this problem that I've seen people take is there's a huge tradition now um, lasting a few few years. Maybe that's not a tradition, but there's there's um there's a there's a new practice you might say of of making what are called alts on Twitter, um, where people uh, who, who similarly are not wanting to be a part of public discussions under their under their actual names uh, will sort of build an online persona or just their own version of themselves and then have a have an avatar that is maybe like a photo of a Roman statue or some sort of crazy psychedelic art uh, or a historical portrait or or whatever and it will be named something other than what they are like the famous one here I think is a uh, Eigen robot. Um, who uh, is, is, I would say, one of the people at the center of this phenomenon that I'm describing. And uh, they, they, they tend to be um, able to play, play the sort of game that you're describing without having to get personally involved, which comes with all sorts of possible consequences, like having your old tweets dug up you know, in the future by some AI algorithm and finding all the ways in which it's not politically correct or something, which would not be ideal. Um, that said, that you know, creating an alt still takes a ton of effort. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not, uh, it's not like you can just pop into that. Um, so beyond beyond the 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 avenues that I described of the other things that anyone can just pop into, Peter, I'm curious if um, if you have thoughts about other ways people could get involved if if they're similar to uh, for some reason. You your name isn't popping up. Oh, Evan. Evan yeah. If they're similar to Evan, where they've been, because because tons of most, I would say most of the people who I would describe as meta tribe are actually in Evan's position. They say they say exactly the same things. Like I've been around since you know the early like extropians with Nick Bostrom, <laughs> or you know I've been around since the beginning of Less Wrong. Like not only Less Wrong 2.0, but Less Wrong 1.0 when they read Slate Star Codex, but they they haven't found a good entry point. Right. Yeah, and, and that's what I found. Um with I had a podcast before the Stoa and I called it Intellectual Explorers Podcast and I rebranded it to the Stoa. And a lot of my podcast listeners came to the Stoa because it's like, oh, I can, I can participate now because it's like an oh, event. Cool. Um, and uh, yeah, two thoughts come to mind, but I just want to flag it. Like, uh, so at the hour, we'll stop recording, but we'll, we'll have like a free associated conversation. I just want to have a recording so we can throw this as maybe a beacon for meta tribalists. Um, cool. uh, so the two thoughts, came to mind with the alt strategy. Uh, there's this, uh, I mentioned this before, but there's a satanic group called the Order of the Nine Angles. It's a mimetic tribe. Satanic? Like, satanic, yeah. And they're, they're just basically like, they, they um, recommend their, uh, their people that uh, the initiates to sacrifice people. They, they just really evil, dark shit. Uh, we sacrifice don't know if it's- actual people? Yes, to get in. Okay. And then one of their um, kind of uh, initiate rites is to, uh, they call it the insight roles is to join extremist organization, whether it's like an Islamic terrorist group or um, like some kind of uh, white nationalist group and embody it completely in order to dismantle, uh, you know, the, the civilizations, Western civilizations grasp on them, just that oh uh, subjective prison. And so they just radically free themselves and then they can pursue the, the satanic goal, whatever it is. So, but like maybe repurposing that for, for good though, like that's the kind of alt strategy where you can kind of create an alt join like maybe a social justice twitter join a post rat twitter or whatever um that's cool and you can I authentically like be an alt like you just like hey this is just my alt account um and then just really embody that tribe to kind of like feel it vibe with it learn that's from beautiful. it that's beautiful i love and that and then uh, maybe shake it off um so yeah that that came from i think that's a pretty cool strategy uh and then the, the other thing to answer evan's question is um Benkatesh rao has something called net play uh, in comparison to like networking uh so basically your network increases by just playing and that's how i treated my podcast it's like i had a podcast oh my god people are so willing to come on podcasts i didn't i didn't like i had no show notes <laughs> i didn't do anything i just wanted to talk to cool people and then it's like like i, I re rekindled my friendship with uh, i wasn't friends with him at the time but he was a, a student uh, teacher relationship with john verveke and then we became on like a mm. research project together so maybe using repurposing these game a tools like podcasting or whatever as a way to net play in order to find the others. And actually on, on that note, um, my, you know, I wasn't, on, I wasn't really on Twitter until maybe a year ago when, when all these people like uh, Michael Kersey and Samo Buryar were telling me, you got to get on Twitter. It's like where the action is happening. And I kept starting and stopping because I was under something like 500 followers and it just 
didn't feel like a conversation. And then the thing that ended up working for me, because there is a pretty high startup cost on something like Twitter, which is basically treating it as a, as an intellectual sketch pad where I just worked out my ideas in public. And then eventually like people, I got, I slowly got follows. And now it's to the point where there are enough followers where I can actually have actual conversations with people, like people who regularly chime in. I think it, there are probably even a few people here who I do that with, who I found through those means. Um, but I think if I, uh, if, if I just started on Twitter and was like, huh, how come nobody's engaging anything that I say, then I probably would have given up in like the first, I mean, I did give up like a few times. And then I was just like, huh, well, okay, I can just treat this as basically Evernote, but live, like live in public. And an alt would probably even help more with that because then you're less afraid of, you're less, you're less attached to your thoughts, right? If someone takes a crap on your beautiful idea, then at least they're not taking a crap on you. Uh, this, let's go to a pivot to a question. Steph, you had a question. Are you here in the room still? You, okay, yeah, I can, I can just sort of read it. Um, yeah, so I don't know, I was, I was wondering more about sort of like the social slash emotional um, impact of, uh, I guess, being a meta driver. Um, you know, Tyler, you mentioned um, sort of having to play a different game with every group. Um, do you sort of feel, I don't know, do you think it's possible to sort of have um, true meaningful friendships, quote unquote, with uh, people who identify with a more tr traditional tribe, say? Um, and what do you sort of do when they um, if you come into a situation where they're like smearing or slandering like people in other tribes, people who you care about, and you sort of know that that's like not a fair depiction of them. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, so to answer the first part, um, I mean, like, like I said, I think it becomes, um, as, as you go from like blue pill to red pill to gray pill, it becomes more and more challenging to, um, to, to feel connection with people with a more traditional orientation to begin with at least. And then over time, um, I've found that it's become easier and easier. And why is that? Um, I, I mean, for me, actually, I don't know if this is a, this is a prescription for everyone, but for me, something that's helped is just going deeper into my uh, meditation practice, and also in particular practicing meta, um, where, you know, I sort of don't associate people with their particular ideas. Um, I don't see that as being representative of them per se. Um, the way, the way I interact with people when I move through the world is that sort of everyone is both this sort of a God, a beast and a baby at the same time. Um, and those are all things worthy of, uh, uh, to, to borrow from C.S. Lewis, worthy of worship. Um, and if you, I find that if I just focus on those those core parts that are worthy of worship, they can say whatever they want and it doesn't matter. I feel I feel a, a really deep connection with them. Um, but then you, I think you still need to interact with that second layer that you mentioned um, <laughs> because they're often, you know, gonna be directly insulting your friends. Um, you know, like someone who I spend time with nearly every day, um, was talking about Trump supporters the other day and talking about them as if they didn't deserve to live. Like, <laughs> it's pretty intense. Um, so in those cases, I actually find those as, uh, I forget, I think it was either Peter or Peter quoting Jason talking about the opportunity for shadow work in these areas. Um, I find that there's both opportunities to do that sort of shadow work in these areas, like find why am I triggered by them talking about this in this way to explore one's own value set. But then furthermore, I think it's just really important to understand how ideas interact with people in general, especially in these really profound ways where they start to identify their souls almost with the ideas. Um, so I usually treat these as opportunities to just ask some questions about their perspective um, and note along the way where I get triggered, which is useful information. But, you know, if I, for instance, if I meet someone who's like, um, all Trump supporters should die or like all billionaires should die. I, I, my reaction now is I try to get actually pretty interested in that. I don't have to believe that to be interested in it. I can be like, huh, so when you mean die, do you mean like literally like 
they should we, they should be killed and, and maybe they say yes and i'm like okay but how like should we send them to like should we guillotine them and they're like well no i'm like well should we uh i don't know firing squads and they're like okay no not really that i'm like so by die maybe you don't mean literally kill them you just mean that they're bad and and it, it kind of helps me understand um how the how the dialect and the and the ideas interact with their actual behavioral stances and, and preferences which to me is just a, a fascinating opportunity for um understanding how human nature works um and how human nature interacts with culture so i i, I sort of do this dual thing where it's like um in terms of where the connection is i feel the connection on the level of of the god the baby and the beast um, but then that's but then but then on top of that you can you can do this meta game as Peter might describe it of trying to understand like how do these ideas operate in a human mind um, and are maybe maybe there are things about them that I missed um, like I would be pretty surprised if it turns out that I should come to believe that Trump supporters and billionaires should die but maybe there are aspects of Trump supporters or billionaires that are harmful for human flourishing that I that I don't know about yet, and maybe I should try to understand those because certainly there are going to be other examples in the world of that sort of particular instance. Um, does that help, Stephanie? Yeah, Steph? that's really helpful, actually. Thanks. I'd be curious how it goes if you're uh, if you if you try practicing it. Um, are you the person on Twitter who yeah. originally mm -hmm. posted a thing? Okay, yeah. Please please let me know if um if that helps. Sure. Thanks. All right, um, Sarah. Um, um, you had a question that tags on Kevin's question. Do you want to maybe address something that Kevin said and then uh, state your question? Yeah, I, I just copied and pasted his text, really. He had a two-part question about basically as the communication revolution increases, uh, only 60% of the world online now, as more, and pe more people get online, the part two was which parts of kind of theory and techniques and tools for synthesizing worldviews would be useful. So is the question, um, it, let me see if I can restate it and if I understand it, is it something like um, right now, not everyone is online, but in the future, a ton more people and, perspect and thus perspectives and techniques and so on will be online. How, how would um, something like the Metatribe go about understanding um, how to prioritize between these things as being useful or is it, um, is it yeah. something else? I think that it ends kind of, is there really tools or techniques that would kind of help these new parts be useful for these new participants in the global meaning making machine? So tips. Hmm. Yeah, I could say a lot of things. Let me think for a moment. Uh, Peter, do you have anything that comes to mind? Not at the moment. I think, yeah, I think the, for some reason, you know, there, like I said, there, there's so many things that one could say here, but two things come most immediately to mind. And I don't know if that's because they're the best ones or because they're just top of mind for whatever reason. I think both of them I was talking about today. So that's probably the actual reason, which is um, one is, um, I got this from Julia Galef, actually. Um, Julia Galef is a podcaster in the rationality movement. Um, I think I think that's a fair description. Um, and she has an amazing podcast. What, what is it called? Uh, Rationally Speaking, um, which is actually one of my entry points. Before I even knew about effective altruism or the rationality movement, I was listening to Julia Galef. Um, and then um, she, she had this practice that I, that I started adopting, which is just noticing your own confusion, um, which sounds so simple. And it's like, okay, but that sounds really basic. How is that even a technique? But it turns out it's not like if, if you start no, if you start really rigorously going throughout the day noticing your your own confusion, you'll start noticing that like most of the day you're actually confused, <laughs> at least some part of you is, um, and you'll start noticing also this counter force to squash the confusion or pretend it's not there. Um, so I think this is going to be one of the best. Uh, practices for the situation you describe, where now you're having this this greater and greater collision of more of, uh, of of a more globalized world, where all these ideas are circulating and intermeshing and opposing one another. Um, the temptation of of a of a human mind that seeks coherence can often just be um, try to come up with the here's what's really going on, um, which is sort of a one size fits all ideology that kind of explains away everything else. And that eventually just minimizes confusion, um, but at the cost of constantly suppressing thoughts to the contrary. Um, 
So I think basically what noticing your confusion helps you do is sort of institute um, a philosophy similar to the philosopher of science, um, Thomas Kuhn, where it's, it's fine, I think, to take a, it, his idea was that it's fine to take a provisional theory. I, I, okay, it wasn't this prescriptive, but this is, this is the version that I'll say, that it's fine to take a provisional theory about what's really going on or what's going on. Um, and, oh, someone wrote, make confusion sexy. Yeah, I, I agree, Ryan, <laughs> so awesome. Um, but then, but then, along with this, with this explanatory framework, which you kind of need to operate through the world, otherwise you become that sort of postmodernist Xbox Xbox player who's just like, screw everything, nothing is meaningful. I'm just gonna, you know, chill all day or or pursue hedonism. The thing you need to do is um, maintain some purpose or or overall explanatory framework or both, but then at the same time, um, not get seduced by it. Um, and as, as Feynman said, Richard Feynman, the famous physicist, the easiest person to trick is yourself. So noticing confusion can help you exit the delusion of um, these idea storms sort of taking, taking hold of you and not letting you go. Um, and uh, the, way, the way I've started doing this, because I realized at a certain point that I'm actually not as good at this as I would like, is just whenever I notice something that is um, anomalous, um, to my mainstream perspective, I'll even just say out loud, I tweeted about this today, I'll just say out loud, anomaly, <laughs> which obviously makes me seem, you know, incredibly sane. Um, but uh, it, it's been helping a lot, like even with little things, like the other day, I wrote about this too, I was, I drove to the grocery store. And when I parked, I heard like a little soft thump on the side of my seat. And I, I, I looked down and, and there was nothing there. And so I was like, oh, that's weird. And I walked out of my car until I realized, oh, and I said anomaly, I said it out loud, but I didn't invest enough curiosity in my own confusion there, that there was just a random thump sound in my car. And then as soon as I walked down my car, I realized, and I, sh I was about to shut the door, and I realized I had left my keys in there, and I was about to lock myself out. <laughs> um, and so uh, I looked under the seat, and like, lo and behold, upon a second glance, there were my, where, there were my keys. But pretty much every time I've said anomaly out loud, and not investigated, I've regretted it. It's always been something like really important like that. And all the more important for these um, all pervading ideologies or worldviews that direct almost all of our actions. So if you don't notice an anomalies with those and, and try to collapse your Kuhnian paradigm or your, your guiding theory or guiding explanation or worldview, the more you're going to be sucked into a matrix of your own creation. So um, I said I was gonna say two, but I'm already monologued on one, so let's just go with noticing your own confusion and, like Ryan said, making it sexy, which is even better. You, you know, on that point, um, and we'll close out after after this, and maybe have a free associative conversation. As as being a facilitator, I always check in with my body, um, and then kind of check in with the field. And then there's there's like kind of yeah. a icky, ickiness uh, going on in this session for me. It's nothing to do with you, uh, Tyler, mm -hmm. but it, it felt like a masturbatory kind of thing like we're talking about this thing so abstract yeah. and i'm like are people enjoying themselves this was what's this boring with this inside baseball thing this felt kind of like a little bit yucky but, but then too, that made yeah. but that made me think though it's like there's no other mimetic tribe that does this that just mm -hmm. has like even considers himself a tribe really and then has this kind of like hyper like um analysis self-analysis on themselves right, right? <laughs> Um, so that's that, the that, tribe that goes, oh no, are we being too tribal right now? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and then by doing this, makes that gives that icky feeling, it makes me not want to be a part of like, you know, a meta tribe or whatever. Exactly. Um, and, and it's like, you know, when, when everyone first starts masturbating and they feel guilty or yucky. So maybe this is a phase <laughs> that we have to have to go through together um, in order to have like, you know, sex. But the, this, this thing with, or become embodied, uh, away from a meta tribe to become an embodied tribe. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah, with, with the other mimetic tribes, it's just like there's an ecology that they're in, uh, that they're just supporting themselves with jokey memes or whatever, and then they're just warring outside of it. So they're just really kind of like trying to fight for a map of reality, really, and then not really kind of questioning it. Uh, but whatever this meta tribe is, is um, doing that, I, I think. Well, I, you know, it's funny you use the word masturbation because, okay, please don't tweet what I'm about to say, but it, the thought came to mind, um, something like a lot of the most world changing things are founded upon some initial like group masturbation, which is basically you, you have to set the ground of what is this thing? What are we all talking about? What do we share in common um, before actually turning your attention toward doing stuff in the world? And so the pretty much the only reason I give a crap about um, the Metatribe being a thing 
um, as, as, as a thing that exists in the world. I mean, well, well for one, it's just a, it's a good way to make friends um, who I get along with. But on the other, you know, my, my background is in effective altruism and I still adhere not necessarily to the mainstream effective altruism philosophy, but at least to the idea that my entire life is in service of all sentient beings. And so uh, my interest is sort of setting a ground, um, uh, cr creating fertile ground for the people who are willing and able to take that task on. And that's a pretty difficult um, gardening task. Um, because I think there, there are lots of iterations where even if they're just a little bit off, like, oops, you ended up with communist Russia. And now like tons of people are getting sent to the gulags in the name of, um, in the name of something that was originally like a beautiful ideal. I would rather not replicate that. But in order to not replicate those sorts of things, there does need to be this initial thing, which might kind of feel like, oh, how many angels are dancing on the head of the pin, um, which is basically this sort of like, the, 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 the sort of masturbatory feeling thing, which is just defining like, what are we, what are we about? Um, who are our people? Um, what is not this thing? What is this thing? And that can feel like just playing insider baseball. But I think that's, that's in my mind, that's kind of a necessary process. But ideally it would be done in tandem with um, something more outward staring. Um, so yeah, I agree with yeah. you there. Yeah, and it's not just the, like here at the store, we have all sorts of practices that we're doing that are dealing with trauma, you know, dealing with the meta system thinking. So I think it's like a combination of all that stuff is needed. And it's like Socrates, you know, it's like um, he knows he knows nothing. And then the best life is the, you know, the, the examine life. Um, and I think that's kind of what we need to do here in the liminal. So that being said, I'm going to stop um, the recording and I'm going to go to the washroom. Uh, so if anyone has to leave oh, right now, idea. they can. Uh, let me take a bio break and then maybe we'll just start up. Um, a free associative conversation whoever wants to stay sound sound cool cool all right mm -hmm. so i'll play some music and we'll